the Father in Christ, the Father in Christ, uh, the Godhead. We haven't talked about the Godhead too much. There's not very many people of our ministers that deal with the Godhead. Uh, somebody says, what is the Godhead? The Godhead is the essence of God. It is what makes God who he is. It's the fullness of God himself. That's what the Godhead is. Now, I want to say, before we get into the word, um, that we are Pentecostal apostolics. We're just not Pentecostal. We are apostolic Pentecostal. And, uh, of course, the, when people ask you what faith you are, and you say apostolic, they don't know what that is. But as soon as you say Pentecostal, uh, they uh, think that they understand what you're talking about. Uh, but there's different branches or different kinds of Pentecostals. Uh, Pentecostal is simply those that have the same experience that the apostles had on the day of Pentecost. But it's a lot more than that. We're Pentecostal in experience, but we're apostolic in doctrine. Now, when you say you're apostolic, they don't know what that is. Well, that's because of what Jesus said. Jesus said on one occasion, marvel not if the world hates you. It hated me before it hated you. And then one scripture says, uh, he came into his own, uh, and his own received him not, uh, and another verse that says um, that uh, he was not known. They didn't know who he was. Now, if they didn't know who Jesus was, then you know they're not going to know who the true church is. He said, the world knoweth us not, the true church, because it knew him not. They did not know that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was God in human flesh. If they have known, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. But because they didn't know who he was, they rejected him. Well, if they didn't know who he was, and we are the body of Christ, then the world is not going to know who we are. They don't recognize us as the true church. Now, of course, we are Pentecostal apostolic. And the word apostolic comes from the word apostles, which means we believe in the teachings of the apostles. Now, I want you to know the apostles were handpicked by Jesus Christ himself, and the apostles were Jews. They were not polytheistic in their beliefs. What is that? That is, they did not believe in more than one God. So the apostles did not believe in a trinity. The Jews did not embrace Trinitarianism. The Christian Trinity began at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD when Constantine held a council to discuss the, uh, uh, the uh, church doctrine, what the church doctrine was going to be. Were they going to continue to baptize in Jesus' name or Father, Son, Holy Ghost, or is there a Trinity, uh, or is there just one God whose name is Jesus? And of course, after they voted and everything, they uh, decided that church doctrine would be that everyone that would get baptized would get baptized Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and that there would be a doctrine of Trinity, that God is a Trinity. Now, the doctrine of the Trinity says that you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, all separate persons, all co-equal, all co-existent, all co-substantial. And so they say that they are three separate personalities and each one of them is God. But then when you tell them that's three gods, they say, no, there's only one God because they say that we are not tritheists. What is tritheist? They're saying we don't believe in three gods. We only believe in one God. But one plus one plus one is not one. It's three. And so we ask them, well, how can that be? How can you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, all three separate persons, all divine, all co-equal in power, and not have three gods? They say, well, it's a mystery. You can't understand a Godhead. And that's where we get them in the trap. 
because the Bible says the Godhead can be understood, and we're going to read that as we go along. But there are many different illustrations that they try to use to illustrate their point to try to prove that there's a trinity. And of course, one of them is that they use an egg. The egg has a shell, it has uh, a yolk, and it has what other part to it? The, the white part, right? We just call it the white part, the white part. They got the white part, the yolk, and the shell. Well, uh, one of our dear sisters gave me some duck eggs, and they were pretty big, and I was trying to tease Sister Rhoda with them, and she looked at me and said, get those things away from me, and I got them away from her real quick, because I know when to move. When Sister Rhoda gets ready, you got to move, not only the Lord, but in my house, when she gets ready, you got to move. But anyway, um, they try to use that to illustrate the Trinity. But I say, well, but it's still one egg, you know. Uh, that doesn't prove a trinity, you know, just because you and then they talk about water, H2O, and all that, and they say, yeah, that's water, H2O, but what does that got to do with the trinity? You know, what they got to do with proving that there's a trinity, because there is not a trinity. Now, the Jews, the apostles, were one God people, and the idea of a trinity, the teaching of a trinity of God started in Babylon. And uh, that's why in Revelation chapter 17, the great whore that sit up upon many waters, Babylon, is the false church system. The false church is any church that teaches the Trinity. That's the false church. Because the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, anyone that confesses that Jesus Christ is not coming to flesh is Antichrist. So you can't be Antichrist and be saved. Can we say amen? <laughs> so uh, the point is then is that Trinity began in Babylon. Now the first known pagan form of worship that we know of um, organized is ancestral worship. Ancestral worship was dated all the way back to Adam's day. And what that worship religion was about was that the people would worship the spirit of their dead relatives. Now some of that still go on, goes on in some of the um, other religions of worshiping the dead relatives. Now the first form of worship was Adam and his God in the Garden of Eden. All right, and then of course Cain who uh, defected from God by presenting a false sacrifice which Many consider that the beginning of false worship, which I have no problem with that because he worshiped God in bringing what he wanted to bring rather than what God wanted him to bring. So if you want to say that's the first one, I have no argument with that. But I'm talking about the first idea formed um, religion, ancestral worship. And so there has always been in the earth since the days of Adam a worship of a trinity of gods. But in the beginning, there was only the worship of one God. Can we say amen? And even Abraham, who was the first Hebrew, um, even he, who at that time his name was Abram, came from an environment of idol worship. And this story I'm about to tell you is certainly most believed among the Jews to this day that Abraham's father, Terah, had a store that sold idols. His stock and trade was idols. And his son Abram, of which he was called before God changed his name to Abraham, he worked in the store and the stock and trade was idols. Now, God had appeared to Abraham in Mesopotamia and appeared to him and told him that he was the El Shaddai, the almighty God. And so Abraham had got the revelation because God appeared to him, according to the seventh chapter, I think it is, of Acts, and let him know that there's only one God and I am that God. And so, uh, but while he was still working in his father's idol shop, uh, his father said he was going to take a trip. And he was going to be gone for an extended period of time. So he left Abram, his oldest son, I believe it was, in charge of the store. And so when he got back from his trip, 
and came into the store, he saw all the idols broken up and torn down. Now this is a story that the Jews believe. And so he asked Abram, he said, well, what happened? And Abram said, well, you see that great big God over there in the corner? Uh, him and these other little gods got to arguing and fighting, and uh, he beat up and smashed all these other gods. Look, he still got the hammer in his hand. And so his father, Terah, says, son, why would you tell a lie like that? You know that these uh, idols are not real, that there's no life in them. He said, well, father, why are you selling them as gods? See, this is where the Lord found Abraham. And so he chose Abraham uh, and decided to build a nation of people out of him, which nation we know as today as the children of Israel. But they were always taught that there was only one God. Now, the heathens round about them, the, um, the, the, um, the different other um, nations that were around them at that time, peoples, the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and different other ones, worshipped all kinds of gods. And even the Egyptians worshipped all kinds of gods. And so when Israel uh, became um, citizens of Egypt, and later on were enslaved to Egypt, they were in Egypt for something like 430 years. And so when God finally brought them out through the hand of Moses, Moses had to redoctrinate them into the truth that there's only one God because they had been under the exposure of Egypt for 430 years. And that's when he brought them out and gave that great commandment, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is what? One Lord, only one God. Now, God proved to the entire world at that time that there was only one God by bringing down the ten plagues upon the Egyptians. Now, those plagues that he brought upon the Egyptians, in one scripture, it talks about the Lord fighting the gods of Egypt. Now, when you look at the plagues, all right, Moses, at the command of God, turned the Nile River into blood. Why the Nile River? Well, because they worshiped the Nile River. And so by God sending Moses and telling them to turn that Nile River into blood, he was letting them know the Nile River is not your God, is not God, I'm God. Look at what I'm doing to the Nile River, and you can't do anything about it, nor can the Nile River do anything about it. So a lot of the plagues that he brought upon them was to show them that these things that you consider gods are no gods at all. That Moses' God is the God. And of course, when he got down to the um, darkness being over the face of the whole land, see Israel, uh, the Egyptians worshiped the sun. And so God, so to speak, said in so many words, I'm putting into my words, okay, we're gonna show you how much of a God the sun is. I created the sun. I made the sun. So I'm going to cause darkness to come on over the whole land. The sun is not going to shine. Since you're going to worship the sun, I'm going to show you what I can do to the sun because I'm God. And then there was darkness over the land. See, all these plagues were connected to Egypt to show them that there was only how many? One God. And that God was the God of the Hebrews. Of course, then it got down to the last plague, the death of the firstborn. So the, oh, that's pretty nice up there. So uh, <laughs> the e Egyptians worshiped Pharaoh. Pharaoh was considered a god. So God told Moses, I'm going to send the death angel through Egypt, and he's going to smite the firstborn in every house from the firstborn of Pharaoh's son, all the way down. And if Pharaoh is such a god, let him stop me from smiting his son. Or after I smite his son, let us see whether he can raise his son from the dead. And that was it with Pharaoh. Once God took his son, he thrust Israel out. But all of these things was to demonstrate that there was only one God. One God. Now, we are apostolic Pentecostals, all right? We are not a denomination. Denominations were started by men. And it started when Martin Luther was forced out of the Catholic Church. He never intended to leave the Catholic Church, but because 
of the practices of the popes, killing people, passing laws that nobody can read the Bible. If anybody was found with a Bible, they would be killed, that no one had the authority to read the Bible but the popes, and that the popes had the authority to change scriptures as they felt that it should say, and all these other types of things. And Martin Luther saw these things, and he protested against the Catholic Church, and he wrote a 99 thesis um, and nailed it on the wall of the church in Wittenberg, Germany. And that was it as far as the Catholic Church was concerned. So he was forced out. Now he was a reformer. He was the first reformer. Any of y'all heard of the Reformation? Now see, I did all this research. And so if you want to see whether or not I'm telling the truth or not, you go do all that work. Give me say amen. I'm, I'm just giving it to you. So that's when the Reformation started, when Martin Luther was forced out of the Catholic Church. And when he was forced out, those that followed him got together, and he formed the Lutheran faith. Now, the Catholic Church adopted the Trinity as official church doctrine in 325 AD. And Martin Luther uh, held on, the Lutheranism, Lutherans held on to that doctrine. Now, Martin Luther never believed in the Trinity. He always believed in one God, according to the statement that he made uh, later on. But nonetheless, the Lutherans that were followers of him held on to that same teaching of the Trinity. Then you had others, John Wesley, that left and formed the Methodist faith. He's the founder, well, of course, it was called Wesleyan after his name, and then later on, the Methodist faith. And then John Smith, who broke off with another group of people with him, and they got, to get, got a group together and formed a, a denomination and called it the Baptist faith. And of course, you had the Episcopalians and the Presbyterians and all of these other individuals. And then many years later, the Jehovah Witness and the Seventh Day Adventists and uh, and, uh, Mary White and all these things. These are denominations. Now, they are called Protestants because they protested against the teachings of the Catholic Church. Now, we are not Protestants. We are not a denomination. We did not come from the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was founded in 150 AD. That's when they had their first man. The Apostolic Church started on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead. So we are not Protestants. We are the only religious faith that believes in one God. Now the Muslims claim that they do, but they don't. They worship worship Muhammad. They are not monotheistic. They say that they are, but they worship uh, this God called Allah. They worship the crescent moon. They worship uh, Muhammad, all these things. So they're not really truly one God. Those that in America that say they are don't really know what they're talking about because they really don't know Islam. As a matter of fact, if they were true Islamic, then they would understand that according to what's written in their Quran, they're supposed to take a trip at least once in their lifetime to Mecca. And you know most of these black folk that claim to be Muslims do not have enough money to get across town. Much less to get all the way to Mecca. Can we say amen? Half of them don't even know where Mecca is at. You know, when you, uh, sometimes it seems like I know more about what they teach than they do. Because I've had their book and I've read their books. And I remember one time I was doing around and, and this uh, inmate had his rug on the floor and he was bowing down and um, um, uh, praying. And, and I'd tell him, I said, Doc, the east is this way. You in the wrong direction. <laughs> because they're supposed, they supposed to pray seven times a day toward the east. You know, but be that as it may, so... The apostolic faith began 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead. The Catholic Church started in 150 AD. And it's kind of funny because when they started, they claimed that Peter was their first pope. Now, I don't know how Peter could have been their first pope because Peter had been dead for 75 years before the Catholic Church was even founded. Plus, he had a wife. Now, the pope is talking about letting the priest marry. And um, we don't know how that's going to turn out, but just to let you know, the Catholic Church is the most powerful church in the world. How do we know that? Because how can one religion have so many pedophiles and not go to prison? They just move them from one parish to another. That's because that's the false church. 
So when you read in the 17th chapter of Revelation, and we're going to teach on the book of Revelation sometime, maybe Lord willing sometime, sometime in 2020, but go verse by verse through the entire book. Um, in the 17th chapter, he talks about Babylon. Babylon is the false church. Why Babylon? Because it was in Babylon when false religions initially began. That's where the Trinity doctrine began. The Christian Trinity, so-called, began at the Nicene Council. But there, man has always worshipped a trinity of gods. That's why Moses had to let them know. You don't follow the practices of Egypt anymore. He's brought you out of Egypt and take you to the promised land. And it's the one God that has done it. Can we say amen? So... Keep in mind then that we are Pentecostal in experience, apostolic in doctrine. Now, generally when you say apostolic, they don't know what you're talking about. As soon as you say Jesus only, they know. Because the term Jesus only, it was a, considered a derogatory term when applied to us. But when we say Jesus only, we're not denying the Father. Now, one of our bishops wanted to take the Jesus only phrase off of our logo. They've already took the image of Christ off. Now they want to take the Jesus only words off the logo because they say that it offends our Trinitarian brethren. Well, first of all, they're not our brethren because they're not in the body. And furthermore, um, they ain't taking down a three crosses. Can we say amen? Anytime you see a church with three crosses, that means they believe in the Trinity. And of course, you know that there was not three gods crucified on the cross. God was not even crucified. Jesus was crucified, the Son of God. And so keep in mind then that they call us heretics because the word heresy means that we do not agree with the traditional form of teachings that is known to be true. Well, it's not true. It is accepted in the world of Christendom, which has to do with all of those denominations. But we are the church of God. Now, that's why I was concerned about uh, the pamphlet I got concerning the Region 5 meeting because one of the topics is relationships. Now, I want to know, and it's going to be interesting because I'm going to sit on every one of those panels and I'm going to have some questions. I'm going to have a lot of fun. But anyway, um, relationships with who? Relationships within the church or relationship with these other denominations? because the other denominations are not saved. They know nothing about the apostolic faith. Many of them think that they do, but they don't know what we believe, like we know. Can we say amen? And the problem is, some of us, not here in this church, but I'm talking generally in the body, don't really know what we believe. Because a lot of times, uh, among us apostolics, we present truth in an incorrect way. There's an incorrect way to present truth. It is incorrect. Well, we know Jesus died on the cross. Is that right? That is correct. But to say that God died on the cross is incorrect because God cannot die. The Son of God died. But you have some that say God died for me and different things like that. It is, that is an incorrect truth. God did not die. The Son of God died. Or God's body died. Or God as a man died died. Not God that died. But anyway, um, keep in mind then that this is what we believe. And what we believe, we got it from the apostles. We did not come from the Catholic Church. We are not Protestants. We are not a denomination established by man. We are the church of Jesus Christ that he established 50 days after he rose from the dead. Can we say amen? And so therefore, when it comes to the oneness of the Godhead, the Godhead of Jesus Christ, the identity of Jesus. All of the essence of God is found in Jesus. Now, when they talk about the Trinity, they say the Trinity is so deep and so mysterious that the Godhead is so deep and so mysterious, they say you can't understand it. And that's not true. And we're going to show you a scripture in just a moment to let you know that the Godhead can be understood. But well, like I told one of them one time, I showed them that scripture in Romans and then immediately they were speechless. And so I made this point. I said the Godhead can be understood, but what you're talking about is the Godhead don't make no sense. That's why it cannot be understood. And God is not the author of what? 
confusion. Can we say amen? So let us look at our first scripture in Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 8 and 9. And you don't hear folk talking about the Godhead too much, do you? See, I know the Godhead backwards and forwards because I was taught two gods for a long time before God opened my eyes in a Bible class to show me Jesus. Now, everywhere I turn, I see Jesus. Why do you think I preach about him so much? I see him everywhere I turn in the Bible. Even Genesis 1 and 1, I see Jesus. All the way to Revelation 22, 21, I see Jesus. Because remember, he said, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. But they, that is the scriptures, are they that testify of who? Me. Why? Because he's God. We say amen. There's not no two or three or four, you know. And one woman said uh, that, you know, when you pray, pray to Mary. Because Mary is God's mother and uh, God has to do what his mother says. Now, you know, you never did what your mother said all the time, did you? Neither did I. <laughs> All right, Colossians chapter number two, verse number eight and nine. Let's read those straight through, then we're going to go back over it, all right? Colossians two, verse eight and nine, let's read. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ, because or for in him dwelleth all the fullness of of the Godhead bodily. In other words, in Jesus Christ, Jesus was God in a body. And when God was in that body, when the Father was in that body, or when the Father was in the Son, the fullness of God was in that body. Now, Jesus was all God as though he was never, a, not a man, and he was all man as though he was not God. And he was both at the same time. Now you think about it like this. God was in that body on the earth. At the same time he was in heaven sitting on the throne. He was on the throne in heaven as the father. He was in that body of flesh as the son. And still filling all space, time, and solid matter. Because as David said, the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. Now, how many of y'all have the Holy Ghost? Let me see you raise your hands. You mean to tell me that God is in all of you and still over in New Albany and down in Lexington and in Michigan where it's cold? Thank God for Michigan. Hallelujah. And in heaven, everywhere at the same time. And so uh, the fullness of God dwelt in that body. All of God was in that body. And when we say all of God that was in that body, Jesus, we're not saying that God was all in that body to the point to where he was nowhere else. That's impossible. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. Now, Satan is not omnipresent. Satan can't be everywhere at the same time. Satan is a created being. God always was. That's why the scripture says, he is he who was, is, and is to come. Only God can be what he was, is, and is to come. The Almighty. Can we say amen? So, let's go back to verse number 8. Now, he says, beware. Beware lest any man spoil you. And that word spoil means to corrupt you. Through number one, philosophy. Number two, and vain deceit. Number three, after the traditions of men. Number four, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Four things we have to be aware of. Now let's take each of them. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. The doctrine of the Trinity is a philosophical thought that came about as far as the Christian Trinity is concerned through the era of Greek, um, Greek thinking 
And uh, of course, as we said, there's always been a trinity of gods worshiped by the pagans, but in their efforts to try to define God and understand God through the era of the Greeks that focused on philosophy, Socrates, Plato, Trismegistus, and Demosthenes, and all these other uh, uh, Greek uh, philosophical theologians, and some of them believed in one God. I believe um, Socrates believed in one God, and uh, Plato was his Y'all say, what in the world is he talking about? <laughs> These were philosophers that lived way back when that tried to understand the scriptures and God through philosophy. And of course, they came up with this idea of the Christian trinity because they were trying to understand the things of God with their natural mind. You can't do that. You cannot understand God with the natural mind. The only way you can understand God is as if he reveals himself. That's the only way you can understand God. There's too much of him. How can we figure out that which is eternal when we are mortal? We are lesser than him. So how can we figure him out? It's impossible. It's impossible for mortal to figure out Immortality, unless immortality reveals to the mortal about things that we know nothing about because immortality is things that are not of this world. Everything of this world is mortal, is limited. Immortality is limitless. You understand what we're saying? Heaven can understand this, but we can't understand heaven unless heaven shows us what it's all about. And that's how God is. But, but they tried to figure God out through their natural mind. And so they conjured up this idea of the Christian Trinity. So the Christian Trinity was born out of philosophy. I'm talking about the Christian Trinity now. All right? And so keep in mind then that a lot of preaching that is done today is philosophical. It's not Bible. A lot of it is philosophical. Now one prominent preacher... I won't call his name because we're recording, but you should be able to figure it out. They say that if you bought this book, and I can't remember the name of the book or the author, but it's a a sociology book. They said if you bought this sociology book, then you'll have all of the sermons of this particular bishop that's down in Texas that everybody loves to listen to. Now, I don't listen to him because the stuff he talk about, I can't relate to. I ain't never tried to walk away from God and he had to drag me back. (laughs) Can we say amen? You know, uh, so a lot of the stuff he talked about, I I, I can't relate to. But one of our bishops said that he appeals to the most gullible people in the church. Now, that's what he said. That's not what I said. That's what Bishop Golder said. But be that as it may, uh, a lot of the preaching and teaching today is based on philosophy, not the Bible. It comes out of their own minds and their own thinking as they try to figure the things of God out through their natural thinking and it can't be right because the flesh can never please God. The only way you can understand God is if he reveals himself to us. That's the only way. If God don't reveal himself, we will never know anything about him. He has to reveal it. All right. Remember when he uh, asked the disciples, who do men say I, the son of man, am? And they said, some say you're John the Baptist, Elias, Jeremiah is one of the prophets. Then he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up for the group and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. What was he saying? You are God in a human body. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood didn't reveal it to you. But who revealed it? The Father, which is in heaven. So any revelation we get from God has to come from God. If it don't come from God and you get it from somewhere else, it's not a revelation. I heard one preacher say it's a devilation. (laughs) It's something the devil gave you or something that you came up out of your own mind. Can we say amen? So we have to be careful. That's why I stick with the scriptures. I stick tight with the scriptures. Uh, um, In the scriptures, the scriptures will give you everything that you need. You don't need a sociological book to try to understand yourself. Just understand this. As Paul said, I know that in me, in my flesh, dwelleth no what? Good thing. That's all you need to know about your flesh. (laughs) 
And so get close to God and be like him. Can we say amen? You don't need to be the best version of yourself because the best version of yourself is going to send self to hell. We need, well, he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in who? So we ain't trying to be the best version of, our, of ourselves. I'm trying to be like Jesus. You see, but that's philosophy. That's philosophy. Be the best version of yourself. Well, if self don't have no good in it, so you tell me to be the best version of myself, so I'm going to be the best wicked version of myself? No. We, he gave us his spirit. And as we live, say, we take on more of his divine nature. What is that? More of his likeness. Becoming more and more like him. Not the best version of ourselves. We want to be like Jesus. And of course, I'm reminded of a scripture in the Old Testament. Said that man at his best state is altogether what? Vanity. You ever read that? Man at the very best he can be is vanity. What is vanity? Worthless. But see, that just goes to show you that a lot of the preaching, a lot of the teaching is philosophical. It's not biblical. So he tells us here, uh, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and what kind of deceit? Vain deceit. Vain deceit. Not just deceit, but vain deceit. There's a lot of preaching and teaching that's going on that's vain deceit. God don't, want you, God don't want you poor. You're supposed to be rich. I was channel surfing last night, and I channel surfed to this preacher, and just as I was getting ready to change, he said, come get this water. <laughs> Bless water. I did get up and get some water. I went in my refrigerator, got some water. I didn't order none from him. But they sell him blessed water. I saw someone selling some blessed soap. Wash this soap, it'll make you clean. So will Dove. Yeah, blessed soap. You see, y'all don't believe me, but I'm, I'm telling you, blessed soap. I remember my mother used to get some mail from this Reverend Ewing. And I remember that name because one of my favorite shows was Dallas, and my favorite character was the most wicked person on the show, J.R. Ewing. So I remember Ewing, and he sent this shower cap one time, and uh, he said, um, let this mind be in you, which is also Christ Jesus. So he said, you put this shower cap on, you have the mind of Christ. Now I had some things going on with my hair or something, and so I put that cap on and took a shower, and there were so many holes in that cap, if, if, but like a wet balloon that was on top of my head. <laughs> Didn't help me at all, Deacon Charles. Not at all. Vain what? Deceit. Vain deceit. Deceive you with some stuff that in the final analysis of it, it is all vain. What does vain mean? Worthless of no value. Can we say Amen. You know, getting this $100 line and this $50 line and all that. When you see preachers doing that, you know they're trying to raise their own offering. That's what they're doing. They're trying to raise their own offering. They better not do it here because we have a standard amount. I don't care how much you take up. You're going to get the standard amount that we're going to give you. And the, and the rest is going into church. <laughs> oh, yeah. Vain deceit. So a lot of the teaching going on out there is vain deceit, trying to deceive you because they want something from you. Vain. So he says that can spoil you. Vain deceit. Then he says, after the what? Tradition of men. Now even in the apostolic church, there were a lot of teachings among us in the old days that were not Bible. They were just tradition and the whole the, the heel out to our shoe pants all that was traditions of men because in Bible days they wore sandals didn't they wear sandals Jesus wore sandals 
And do you think that they had the Gucci sandals that they have today? No. A lot of stuff. Now, they meant well, but it was still traditions of who? Men. You know, I knew one preacher that said it was a sin for a woman to have a perm in her head, and you should have saw them sisters. <laughs> you should have saw them sisters. I knew one pastor that said you had to wear one type of stockings, dark. You should have saw them sisters. Some of them came in dressed like Lily Munster. I couldn't even believe it. Yeah, that's what they taught. You know what all that was? There wasn't no Bible behind that. But we had to abide by it because the Bible says obey them. Now what? I mean, my pastor put my sister out of the church because he heard she had on pants. Now, he could have gotten a million things, a million reasons to put my sister out because she was a mess. But he chose that because he heard that she had some pants. Now, the minute book has been around for many years. And it was always in the minute book. Our position on Deuteronomy 22 and 5. A woman should not wear that which pertaineth to a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are an abomination to the Lord. That was not dealing with pants because they didn't have no pants in that day. Did you know that pants were actually created for women? Originally, because they rode horses. Somebody asked me, day Bible class, what did the men wear? <laughs> they wore something. Um, uh, they wore skirts. The women, the men wore skirts. Uh, uh, the men wore skirts. Some women wore pants. And over there, the, the, the Scottish army, they wear those Scottish kilts. Is that right? And some of those men are the toughest men. So somebody asked me, so would it be proper for a man to come into church with a dress? No. Because that's not our culture. You know, not at all. But pants were originally made for women because of them riding horses. And men at first didn't like them and wouldn't wear them. But later on, it caught on. And now, and then eventually, it flip-flopped, didn't it? Where the women wore skirts all the time and the men w wear pants. So... That scripture is not dealing with pants because there was no such thing as pants. The closest to pants you had in the Bible were linen breeches that the high priest wore, the under priest wore up underneath their robes, which went from the waist down to the thighs, and what we would call shorts. But that scripture was dealing with that a woman was not to dress, to masquerade herself as a man. And a man was not to dress to masquerade himself as a woman. It was dealing with homosexuality and cross-dressing. That's what that was dealing with. Now, that's been in the minute book for decades. But many of our brethren were still using that scripture and say, no pants. They just were not reading the minute book. And instilled the traditions of men. Now, I remember that my pastor taught it was a sin to go to the prom. And uh, we were in high school, and um, I remember the queen of Jackson High was in my homeroom class. I think I was in the 10th grade. And of course, everybody was wondering who was going to go with who to the prom. And so she uh, was in my homeroom class, and she was supposed to be the queen of the school, what have you. And she turned to me. Guess what she asked me? Deacon Charles asked me to take her to the prom. I said, I'm saved. I don't go to the prom. <laughs> that haunted me throughout my whole time at high school. I was laughed, talked about, but I said, I don't go to prom. So she sat back. She said, I ain't never been turned down. I said, well, there's a first time for everything. See, I was getting started back then, right then. I said, you can come to church with me. Well, I don't go to church. Well, I said, well, you want me to go to prom with you, but you don't want to come to church. You need to be saved. Well, I guess she got pregnant. And because her family was so, um, I guess, uh, prominent or uppity, whatever, uh, when she got pregnant, they moved out of the city and never saw her again. But I did not go to the prom because of the position of my pastor at the time. I didn't think it was suitable for me to go because I wasn't concerned about no prom. I'm out there preaching on the corner. I ain't going to no prom. 
Well, I had a Sunday school class of about eight girls that I taught, young um, teenage girls. Uh, and of course, um, teaching them, and they had all these questions because, you know, the, the past was kind of strict, and I'm in it answering all these questions that they had. And uh, how come we can go to the prom? And, you know, all these type of things. So, but when the pastor's daughter got of age, she not only went to the prom, but he rented a white limousine for her to go to the prom. And all those girls in my class backslid. And they're still backslidden to this day. One of them became a lesbian. So when I started pastoring, I said, now, Lord, what am I going to do as far as the church standard? I said, because I don't want to set a standard and then back away from it or deviate or fall from it. You know, people say today we let down the standard. What standard have we let down? Whose standard? I'm asking you, whose standard have we let down? You know. Most of the time, they're talking about t the traditions of men, pastors in our churches that have set up certain standards that are not biblically based, but expect for you to abide by. So I said, Lord, what am I going to teach concerning makeup? What am I going to teach concerning pants? What am I going to teach concerning earrings? God said, leave all that alone. Teach modesty. Let me be the Holy Ghost. And that's what I've been doing ever since. You know, but the traditions of men. Now, Bishop Paddock had 12 children. Only the first child died before the second child was born. So he raised 11 children. All of them got saved. All of them backslid. Because he could not even throw a baseball and play catch with them out in the yard because he was taught it was a sin. He couldn't even throw a football with any of his kids. They could not participate in sports because it was taught it was a sin. He said the only thing his kids could come and do was come home and sit down and look at one another. Nothing to do. And what happened? They all backslid. Well, uh, the traditions of men and a lot of the stuff that they now, they had good intentions. They just didn't have the knowledge that we have today. Can we say amen? They had good intentions. You know, but Paul here talks about that there are those in the church uh, or, or there, are, there are those that have traditions of men that they want you to abide by that can corrupt you, that can spoil you. Now, I'm not trying to say that those traditions that they had corrupted us or anything like that, you know, but I'm just using those as an example of the fact that there were traditions of men. Now, where did all that come from? Why, where did we get all that tough standard from? Well, when God first poured out the Holy Ghost um, in, in the, uh, uh, in, uh, it wasn't quite in this country, but uh, in the early days of the Latter Rain Church, when he first poured out the Holy Ghost, he poured it out upon the Mennonites, the Puritans, and the Methodist people. And these people lived in the Victorian age where their dresses swept the floor and their uh, outfits that they were did not even expose their necks. I'm talking about the Puritans and the Mennonites, these religious people that call themselves holiness churches. It was among them that God poured out the Holy Ghost. And so uh, even the wife, when she was doing the washing in her house on the old washing board, um, she would not pull up her sleeves and her forearms because a salesman might come to the door and she might forget to roll her sleeves down and go to the front door and the salesman would see her forearms. <coughs> That's just how they were in that Victorian age. Well, it was among those people that God filled with the Holy Ghost. And some of the fathers that later on got saved, their parents were from that age. And so those standards carried over into the church. And that's where all of those things came from. But see, God's church is not an American church. It's a universal church. Because you have some folk over in Africa that are saved that wear very little clothing. Because that's their culture. Now you think you're going to go over there and impose our American standards upon them over there as hot as it is over there? <coughs> Y'all got real quiet on me, have you? 
God's church is an, not an American church. It is a universal church. And there are different cultures in our world that people live in, abide by, just like we abide by and live in the culture that we are in right now. And we cannot impose our culture upon them. And they cannot impose their culture upon us. Uh, but God has people all over the world, even in communist China. There's more folks saved in China than there is over here in the United States. Did you know that? No. All right, so the tradition of men. Then it says, after the rudiments of the world. Now, the rudiments of the world, the rudiments has to do with the elements that come from the world or those things that influence the world. We have to be careful not to allow the teachings of the world come into the church and corrupt us. <clears throat> Can we say amen? Now, December 1st, in Michigan, marijuana is legalized for recreational use. And so I called my brother and I said, you got any weed? <laughs> he said, oh, I got plenty. I, I know you do. I said, I guess I can't call the police on you no more, threaten to call the police on you no more, because now it's legal. Now that's the world. Now if you think that you can have marijuana because it's legal in society, you are mistaken. But you know that there's some preachers that have some investments in cannabis, marijuana, making money. Do you think God is pleased with that? Helping to promote buying stock in cannabis and all that kind of stuff? Oh, they're making a lot of money now because weed is being sold all over the place. So just because society has embraced certain things, the rudiments of the world, that is not for us. Can we say amen? And of course, um, the, the, the world is attacking the church. We are under attack. When they passed those gay laws, that was to attack the church, and they're coming after the church. That's why we don't do any outside marriages in this church, because I was warned by a lawyer, a friend of mine, that said that these homosexuals are calling churches trying to get them so that they can sue them with a lawsuit of discrimination. So we just don't do no outside marriages here. You have to be a member of this church to be married here. And so uh, we ain't going to worry about that. Can we say amen? But a lot of them are getting caught up in that. You know, because the, the, the devil is attacking the church through the laws of man. And many of our brethren are cowering in a corner, compromising, giving them, and they're being spoiled by the rudiments of the world. We can't allow that to happen. You see, Paul wrote the book of Colossians because they were dealing with a teaching called Gnosticism that was saying that Jesus was just an angelic being and that God is knowledge. And this is why he wrote this epistle. So that's why he talks about beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy because Gnosticism was being taught and all these type of things and it was coming to the church. And so he was warning them that knowledge is not God. But then he goes in verse number nine and says, for in him dwelleth what? All of the what? Fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus is God in a human body, not knowledge, not the mind of man. And of course, those were the early seeds of secular humanism. What is secular humanism? The emphasis of man and the de-emphasis of God. And it is being taught in our universities. That's why a lot of our young people, they leave church, go to college and backslide because they get spoiled through philosophy, vain deceit, traditions of men, and the rudiments of the world. And they come back and challenge us as to whether or not what we taught them and what they were raised up was true. That's what's happening in our universities right now. Well, that's why I told our daughter she had to stay close to home. <laughs> and uh, thank God the Lord kept her. Can we say amen? 
Now, the Godhead can be understood. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. We got about 10 minutes. Romans chapter 1. And we are not nearly as far as I got in day Bible class. We had a very nice crowd in day Bible class. One of our largest crowds. And I am not nearly as far as I was there. So they say when it comes to the Trinity, Godhead, you can't understand it. It's a mystery. They say the Godhead cannot be understood. That's not what your Bible said. Romans chapter 1, verse number 19 and 20. All right. Verse 19 and 20. All right. <laughs> If we have it, let's read. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. So how can that be known of God be known? It's manifest. It's revealed in them. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Let's read. For God has showed it unto them. So let me give you an example of that. That there is one God. That is is no, that which is known of God, that he's one God, is manifest in them, but God has showed it unto them. Who's that man? God has shown man that there's only one God. Now, how did he do that? Well, man is made in the image of God. Is that right? So when you look at yourself in the mirror, how many people you see? That shows you that there's one God. There's one of you. There's only one of you. Now, I don't believe in doppelgangers. You know what doppelgangers is? Y'all see that movie, Us? Some of y'all are scared to say it because you think it's a sin to go to the movies. It's just a sin. You just got to be careful where you go. <laughs> doppelgangers. That's a strange movie. Lord Hammer, I had to pray for I went to sleep. It's not that movie. Um, but <laughs> somebody said, you shouldn't have been watching it. You're probably right. I said, is there another Sister Rhoda running around somewhere? I don't want there to be because uh, I don't have that much money for another Sister Rhoda. All right. She's probably watching, so I'm already in trouble. But anyway, um, when you look at yourself, you should know that there's only one God because there's only one of you. Now, I remember when I started at the prison, and I first started... They said, you look just like Officer Davenport. I said, who is that? Well, she lives in, I said, hold it. <laughs> I said, we about, to get, we about to fight now. What you talking about, she? There might be someone that favor you, but there's only one you. Is that right? And so the fact that there's only one you should let us know that there's only one God. So... Understand that there's one God is innate in us, that there's only one, all right? Verse number 20, let's read. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are what? Clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Now, we are the things that are made, and God's creation are the things that are made. The earth, the sun, the moon, and the stars, Clouds, the wind, breath, the water, oxygen, hydrogen, all these gases and all these types of things. Um, these are the things that are made. So the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. What are those invisible things that we see when we look out in creation? Those invisible things that we see are the attributes of God that he used to make everything that exists. When we look out, we see his power because the sun is 96 million miles away hanging on nothing. We see his power when the earth turns on his axis and, and of course the sun looks like it's actually going down and then looks like that the moon is rising and the moon has light, gets its light from the sun. We see that that is the power of who? God. When we look at all of his creation, the animals, and they're still finding animals and insects and life in places that they never discovered before, we see the intelligence of God. Can we say amen? 
So the invisible things of him is his might, his power, his intelligence, his wisdom, his knowledge, his ability, everything that is of him that he used to make everything that exists today. That is the invisible things of him. We know that there has to be a God that exists to put the sun 96 million miles away. And in the winter time, the sun is shining and you need to put a coat on. Summertime, the sun is shining and you get darker. Can we say amen? Oh, your hair frizzles because of the heat. That makes sense? That's the invisible things of him. So he says, for the invisible things of him are from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. We understand that everything came about by his power and his wisdom and his might and his intelligence. All right? By the things that are made. Let's read. Even his eternal power and what? Godhead so that they are what? So... The Godhead then can be understood because the Godhead is part of the things of the invisible things of him that he has made. It is the, uh, or the invisible things that exist. The fullness of God. So we can understand that there's only one God. How? Because he reveals it to us. So when they say that you can't understand the Godhead, when they try to explain to you the Trinity, and they say you can't figure it out because you can't understand the Godhead, they are mistaken. The Godhead you can understand. But what they're talking about, you can't understand. Because as Johnny James said on one occasion, it don't make good nonsense. It don't make any sense. Why? Because it is philosophy is not based on the scriptures. Can we say amen? Now, um, uh, we don't have time. We're going to have to stop because we were just about to begin the Bible class. All this was the preliminary to get you up to <laughs> the Bible class. But what we want to show you uh, in, in the upcoming Bible classes is that the fatherhood of God is shown in Jesus Christ. And we were going to look at it from the standpoint of the priesthood and the priest office that God has established in the Old Testament and show you those things. But we just did not have time. I got way further in day Bible class than tonight. I don't know what happened with that. Um, but we're going to close. Are there any questions? Any questions tonight? All right. That was a lot, was it? And we, you got a question? First Timothy 3.16. All right. First Timothy 3.16. All right. This is uh, uh, one of the verses that it misinterpreted. Um, it says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. A lot of preachers like to use this and say this scripture shows the Godhead, but he's not talking about the Godhead. He's talking about the mystery of godliness. What is godliness? Godlikeness. Godliness is a mystery that is revealed. He says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was, number one, manifest in the flesh. Number two, justified in the spirit. Number three, seen of angels. Number four, preaching to the Gentiles. Number five, believed in the world. Number six, received unto glory. God did all of these things to reveal godliness. He took on human flesh to reveal godliness. He was justified in the spirit at the rivers of Jordan when he was baptized by John. And the heavens opened and the spirit of God ascended upon him in the form of a dove. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased justified in the spirit, seen of angels. God for the first time was seen of angels because he took on a human body. Because even the angels got to veil his face before God because God is just that powerful. So he was seen of angels. He preached unto the Gentiles. Who was the Gentiles he preached to? The woman at the well. He said to her, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him what? 
spirit and truth. So he preached unto the Gentiles. He was believed on in the world by his disciples, and he was received up into glory. He did all these things to reveal to us the mystery of godliness, what God is like. That's what that's dealing with. All right, anyone else? Praise the Lord. Will you talk about the, the tradition of men? For those of us who came up in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, now we was taught uh, certain things about what to wear, what not to wear. What should be the mindset of uh, the believers who came up in that era, you know? What do you mean? Now, what do you mean? Like, we was taught when we came in, pants. And uh, that was one of the things that was hard for me to give up. But because, like you said, because it was a teaching, we gave it up. Not going to the movie, we gave it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not, uh, uh, some, of the, some of the earrings, even Bishop Stewart started teaching that, about some of that, some of that story, but some of us, we, we still, we had, we was taught, like I said, all of that was wrong, like almost like we were stripped, but because we wanted to be saved, we was obedient. Now, we see, you know, the liberality of, of, of the saints now able to do these things, what should be the mindset, you know, well, first even, in, even in the dress, uh, it's, it's a lot of it's a lot of things that are more revealing uh, in the church now when we came up. Uh, we, was, we was taught to cover up. <laughs> well, let me say this. Any pastor back in those days, if they thought that every member of the church was abiding by their standard just because they saw them in church without pants, they are sadly mistaken. Because God's people are the same, regardless of what era they lived in, because people are the same. Now, we have to keep in mind that every pastor has to teach his congregation based on his conscience before God. And um, what they taught was based on their conscience. A lot of the things that they taught, they had no scripture. Um, some of them because of the volume of scriptures that they had knowledge of, they came to those conclusions that you should not do these things. Now, um, a lot of times they didn't have no scripture for it. Uh, but today we have more revelation of God's word. We have more understanding of the scriptures that they had in that day. Now, uh, the subject of pants. It's always been in the minute book, our position on that. It's just that some of the pastors were not teaching it. Because even though that they signed license stating that they abide by the teaching of the minute book, they didn't. Mr. Paddock told us a story about nine pastors that filed a complaint against their diocesan because the diocesan was teaching that um, it was a sin to wear pants. And the sisters were working in the fields picking apples off trees and they were on ladders. And the men would walk, walk by looking up underneath their dresses because they were on ladders. And so the sisters uh, petitioned to the, their pastor uh, about uh, being able to wear pants. And uh, um, the pastors um, went to the diocesan and he said no. Now there were nine churches involved in that. Now Bishop Paddock, I believe it was, was on the Judiciary Committee. And so he got the complaint. And so he went to the bishop board about it. On that bishop board, among others, Bishop Grimes, Bishop David T. Schultz, Bishop F.I. Douglas, were a few of those men that were on that board. And uh, the Dias they filed a complaint against diocesan, and they brought these complaints to the bishop board, saying that can the sisters wear pants because their nakedness is being exposed, and these are jobs that they have to have in order to survive, to take care of their families. 
And uh, the uh, position was that the Bible says that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And uh, so why can't they wear pants? The bishop board voted it down. And Bishop Paddock, he wasn't bishop at that time, he said, uh, brethren, if we don't do something about this, we're going to lose nine churches out of the San Bernardino Valley if we don't address this issue. So they rejected the complaint of the pastors of those churches. And so they sent in another plea for them to reconsider. And Bishop Pack said, y'all need to reconsider this because we're going to lose these churches. They refused. We lost nine churches out of the PEW because they would not um, concede with that. Now, that, they did that based on their conscience. Now, was it right? No, it was not right. There's nothing modesty about that. But ironic enough, the next year, Bishop Paddock was on the board, <laughs> you know. But um, Bishop Hancock was the strictest person that the PAW has ever had. And he had the largest church in the PAW for years, 4,000 members way back in the uh, 40s and 50s. And even Bishop Hancock, as strict as he was, Bishop Hancock was so strict, he didn't have a choir. The man had 4,000 members and would not have a choir because he didn't believe in choirs. Um, even he said that it is proper to have pants if you wear, if you work a certain job. But many of those brothers would not accept it. So the thing of it today is if that is still your conviction, you hold to your conviction. If it's your conviction not to wear pants, then you don't wear them. If it's your conviction you don't wear makeup, then don't wear it. It's like Paul said, uh, some brethren um, won't eat certain meats. Some brethren, because they were Gentiles, will. So he said, if you don't want to eat, then don't eat it. But don't judge your brother that does eat. And then if your brother does eat, make sure that you don't offend your brother by eating what your brother feels is wrong to eat. So if you know as saints that the standard that you were under was not to wear pants to church, then you should consider that not to offend your brother and sister by wearing pants wear to church. If you know that the former standard was that you should not wear it, and there are still some that hold to that standard, still some that believe in that, because once the pastor puts something in you, it's hard to get it out. Once you put it in you, put it in you. But if you know that that's the, that was the standard at one time, yeah, there's nothing wrong with you're not in sin wearing pants, you know, but if you know that there are some in the church that don't believe that you should do it at church, then you're supposed to prefer your brother and not wear them at church. Now, there are some dresses that are more revealing than pants. There are some dresses that sisters should not be wearing because of the type of figure that they have. So, you, so there, there's, there's that component too. So if a girl walks in with a, a tight fitting dress on, is she justified before God because it's a dress and it's not pants? No. And of course, I've said before, no sister should be wearing any outfits that, uh, that expose any part of her body. She should not be wearing any outfit that highlights her figure because 95% of all apparel is designed to attract the opposite sex. And we're supposed to dress with modesty, with shamefacedness and sobriety. Now what does shamefacedness is? Shamefacedness is this. You should be ashamed to dress in a manner that causes you to draw attention to yourself. And I've seen some sisters come in this church with improper attire and I've gotten very angry and almost told them, get out of here and go put some right clothes on. I almost did that a couple times, but I had to get my righteous indignation together. So I would tell my wife, go talk to them. Uh, because a lot of times how you dress tells how spiritual you are. If you have a problem with lust 
then you're going to dress like you have a problem with lust. Y'all don't get real quiet, but that's the fact. You, uh, there's just, every sister can't wear the same outfit. You know, so some, in some cases, wearing pants would be better than some of the dresses and outfits that I see sisters wear. Are they just before God because it's a dress? Can we say amen? So my thing is this. Um, I came up out of that era. Um, that's why I prayed and asked the Lord, I want to do what's right. He said, leave all that stuff alone. Just teach the word of God. Let me be the Holy Ghost. But if this is your conviction that was put in you, there is nothing wrong with that. But don't look down upon your brother and your sister because they don't have the same conviction, especially when their conviction does not conflict with the scripture. Now, um, I don't believe that a man that is saved ought to be wearing earrings. I don't believe in that. Now, the reason why I don't believe in that is because of this. When they first started wearing earrings, they wore it in the left ear because that meant that they were homosexual. They wore it in both ears because that meant they were bisexual. But a lot of the young people today don't know that. So I remember all of that when that stuff came. I remember when contemporary gospel came out. Contemporary, you know what contemporary gospel is? Contemporary gospel is music that you can, that the beat and the lyrics and the song is made in a certain way that you can interpret it being God or your lover. And of course, you know. That's not of God. So just because it says gospel music don't mean that it is what? And just because it's got Jesus in it don't mean I heard Snoop Dogg on the radio supposed to be singing a gospel song and he was cussing in it with Jesus' name in it. <laughs> now am I going to listen to that just because it says gospel? Ain't no gospel at all. You know. So we need to teach on music because a lot of these songs is not gospel music. That song, I'm good, I woke up this morning, I'm good, I got a nice job, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. He didn't say God was good, he said he was good. Now, there ain't no gospel song, you know. So, I think, if I were you, I would stick with my convictions. If that's what you believe, stick with your convictions. But don't look down upon someone else that don't have the same convictions that you have, but nonetheless do have convictions that are not conflicting with the scriptures. I don't think it's wrong for women to wear earrings. I just think that everything that a woman does should be in modesty. And everything that a man does should be what? Modesty. I don't agree with all these men wearing these tight suits. I saw a suffragan bishop in Michigan, and I walked up to him and said, Doc, I'm tired of looking at you with these tight suits on. The other district got about choked on his food. I said, we all know that you got muscles and everything. I said, but then I start pulling on his jacket. I said, what, what is wrong with you, man? You supposed to be a suffering ambition. Now he got mad. I thought he was gonna throw that chicken at me. He was mad. <laughs> but I, <laughs> if he threw it, I would've ate it. But I, but I told somebody when I saw him, I'm gonna tell him and they didn't believe me. I said, you walking, and I didn't know that in some of his Bible classes, he would take off his suit jacket and have a compression shirt on. Now you know that ain't modesty. Do you know what a compression shirt is? And what kind of modesty is that? So I was getting on him about, but, but we know it must have been God then, because I didn't know that. And he, and he got mad. So you know who like you know who like to wear those kind of outfits? Tight skinny pants look like that they've been poured in, and the tight suit jackets that they wear showing all the you know the kind of people that wear them. Now we done getting into clothes and pants and earrings. You see what y'all done? But you know, it's it, it's the truth. It's the truth. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the last one we're gonna take an offering. Praise the Lord. Pastor. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, could you tell me is this scriptural about us being peculiar people and another 
Let me see if you, can you, is that scripture? Yes, uh, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. Peculiar means a special kind of people in the sight of God. Okay. That's and what a, that means. Excuse me, I'm sorry. And another one is, uh, it's a scripture about it says, in this, uh, we're in this world, we're in this world, but not of this world. Right. It says scripture too. Yes, like that. that is found um, in, um, Jesus mentioned that. In the 17th chapter, St. John, and um, and I can't remember another scripture where that it, it is, but it is does say that we are in the world, but we're not supposed to be of the world. All right, that is, we are not supposed to be a product of what the world promotes. All right, we're not supposed to be like that. All right, well, you got more than you bargained for, did you? Let's take an offering <laughs> on tonight. Let's take our offering. Thank you for your patience. 